Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to take a look inside a very interesting piece of equipment, a very rare alignment device for these things. So the instrument that we're going to take a look inside of was used at Tektronix to align these when they were brand new off the factory line. Very neat piece of equipment to own. So let's take a look inside this thing and see what's in it. Here we are in lab number two, and what you see is just some of the projects that are coming up. So this is the old time workbench. And on the old time workbench is a very large Type 50 TU test unit right in front of us. And that's what is used to align the 500 series oscilloscopes and other scopes as well. So we are going to use this piece of gear right here to do alignments on scopes like all of these right here. So that should be a lot of fun. So lots of projects, as you can see, coming up. So what I'll do is I'll get a little closer to the Type 50 TU test unit, take a look at it, and then we'll take a look inside and see what they're hiding inside this really heavy piece of gear that's fan-cooled and has air filters on both sides. Here's a closer look at the face of the Type 50 TU test unit. And as you can see, it has different blocks for testing different portions of the oscilloscope. And these blocks can be selected by that selector knob there. You can see one arrow points to this block, another to this block here, and another to this block here. Now one thing that's really important to have with this is the attenuator probe. And that is this piece right here. So we'll take a look at this and inside this right at the end here. So we'll take uh, take this all apart and look inside and see what's in there. I believe there is a tube inside here. So it has uh, power to this and everything. So this plugs into this right here, like so. And then just give this a twist and it locks this into place. And then this here would go to the oscilloscope vertical input. And then this is the volts peak to peak attenuator here, so you can set it to all the different ranges. So, nice piece to have. I was very lucky to get this attenuator with this, because a lot of these things, they're separated and throughout time, these things go missing. Very important piece to have with this. So when we go through and restore this thing and align it, I really don't think there's a whole lot to do restoration-wise with this thing. Most likely going to be an alignment, maybe changing of a few parts, probably classified more as a repair, if anything. So go through it and make sure that it's working and then calibrate this so we can use this and we can calibrate some larger oscilloscopes together. So it's one thing to be able to use an oscilloscope. It's another thing to know as much about an oscilloscope to be able to calibrate it. And I'm going to show you guys all of this here in the near future. So as you can see here, we have an amplitude calibrator. So this is calibrates the amplitude here for this one section. And we have a sine wave output. It puts out 50 kilocycles, 5 megacycles, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 megacycles to calibrate these oscilloscopes. We have a square wave generator up here. So we can generate square waves from 10 to 100 cycles, 100 to 1,000 cycles, 1 to 10 kilocycles, or 10 kilohertz if you like. Modern speak, that would be kilohertz. So whenever you see kilocycles, if you're not familiar with cycles, just change it to hertz. So kilohertz. 50 to 500 kilohertz, and 50 to uh, 500 kilohertz here, and this is a fast rise output. So this is a very fast rise. So basically the same thing, but just very fast rise here. Again, we can adjust the amplitude right here and vary the frequency. Now this is a very important part of this right here, the time mark generator. What that allows us to do is calibrate the horizontal time base and make it read correct to the graticule on the oscilloscope. So we have all of these switches and we can combine them. It's not only one, we can put one or two together at the same time. But if we wanted to calibrate the screen for one microsecond, we turn that on and we would have markers on the screen for one microsecond. And it's the same thing for if we wanted to go as low as five seconds, 
which in most, well, in a lot of my oscilloscopes is in roll mode. So you click it onto five and then every five seconds you would get a mark. So that's the way it goes. So we have markers here and we also have a signal selector for five, 10 and 50 megacycles output. So megahertz. So it'd be 50 megahertz output right here. And we also have a trigger. It helps with the very slow signals as well. So lots of stuff to align and check out on this thing when we actually go through it, make sure everything is working properly. With modern equipment, aligning something like this is actually very straightforward. And usually tech is very good. They mark everything inside. So it just makes it all that much easier to align. A lot of pieces of test equipment, they'll have VRs and coils and everything all over the place, but nothing's marked. So you have to have a manual. This is just, you can look at it and go, oh, okay, you know, this is the, the alignment for this section here or a marker alignment, and you can trim everything up. It's very, very nice. That's usually the way tech went you know, with all their oscilloscopes as well. Everything was marked inside. So very nice. And any type of servicing that needed to be done in the field could very easily be done by a technician because you can take the case apart on the unit, you know, lift it up off and go, oh, okay, this is out of alignment. I need to adjust, you know, the 150 volt source or something like that. Or, you know, you align it and away it goes again, right? Again, you know, like this stuff back in the day was absolute top notch, absolute top notch equipment. So what I'm going to do now is turn this thing around. Actually, what I'll do is I'll show you the air filters on the side. So there's one here. This here is the intake filter, so it draws air in this way. And then on the other side, ouch, is the output. <laughs> That's heavy. This is the output right here. So it blows air out this way and draws it through the case to keep all the vacuum tubes cool. And there are a lot of vacuum tubes in this unit. So what I'll do is, is I'll turn this thing around, get the cord off the top here. Even came with the special cord with the uh, angled plug on it. So get this off the top, turn the thing around, remove this, and we'll take a look inside and see what kind of tubes we have going on and how they've laid this thing out. In order to get inside the unit, it's really quite easy. I just have to give this fastener a twist and that one a twist. I don't need to completely remove them. Just give them a twist like this. And like so. And then put my hands on the top and then pull towards myself. And the whole case comes off like that. And there are a lot of tubes up here. So what I'll do is I'll just open this up. And I'll bring the camera in a little closer and we'll take a look around. All right, let's take a look around. So here we go. Look at all the tubes in there. That is a lot of tubes. You can see why this thing definitely needs to be fan cooled. So it pulls air in from this side over here and the fan exhausts on this side here. Lots of tubes there. Five selenium rectifiers. And if I can leave those in, I'm going to leave those in. Supposedly this unit does work. So there is, looks to be some form of a oil splatter or something on the chassis. I really don't know what that is. And it's all over the place. It might just be dirt. Maybe at some time the a filter was oiled or something and it was pulled through because I can see it all over the chassis. So it's not just concentrated in one area. So it's not like a component exploded or something like that. It's probably just drawn off of an oiled air cleaner. Somebody probably did something at some time in the past with this thing. So this would be the regulation section down here. And on the top, this is the time mark generator. And there's a lot of adjustments on the upper side of this. And we'll take a look at that in a moment. I'll show you all the adjustments to make sure that the time mark generator is okay. You can see down here is an oscillator. And these are all the adjustments for the oscillator. 6C4 oscillator tube there, regulator tube in the back, and more tubes hiding back in there, and some tubes up in here as well. So you a sea of tubes up here, lots and lots of vacuum tubes there. So all in all, this looks like it's in very nice condition. 
you know, it, it, it's very clean inside. So somebody has taken good care of this thing. Of course, you know, routine maintenance would mean spraying the switches with a cleaner and cleaning them out, moving them around and things like that. And hopefully, you know, the tubes are okay too as well, because that is important. So, and there are a lot of them here. I couldn't imagine retubing this with brand new vacuum tubes. That would be a very expensive thing to do if you had to replace all of these tubes and everything in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the camera and I'll look at the top side of this and I'll show you all the adjustments that are made and you can take a look at the components and how tech put this together on the ceramic strips. It's a really nice design. Here's a look at the top side of the unit and as you can see right in the time mark generator they have all the adjustments marked to make the alignment nice and easy. You can see the really nice construction with these ceramic strips. Now, whenever you're working on anything like this, they suggest that you use solder that has a silver content in it. If not, it can cause problems with migration and it can damage these ceramic strips. So the little portions that the resistors are soldered into can actually come out of the ceramic strip. So that's a very important thing to remember whenever servicing anything like this. You can see that they've used these spray capacitors that have the red writing on them. And that means that these are a dye film type capacitor and these are fine. They don't exhibit very much leakage at all. So no problems there. As you can see, very nicely laid out all over the place. It's just, you know, the quality that's put into these things is really quite incredible. Now these Goodall type capacitors, I'm not sure, Goodall makes all sorts of different types of capacitors. And I'm not sure if these are going to be leaky or not. And that's one thing that I'm going to want to check. In fact, why don't we do that now? What I'll do is I'll turn on the soldering iron and I'll remove this one here. And we'll just check it and see if it's leaky. I'm kind of thinking that it's probably going to be good. But I've had good all capacitors that do leak in the past. So it'd be interesting just to check that out right now and find out. Okay, what I'm going to do is desolder this end of this good all capacitor so that I can test this for electrical leakage. So this end of the capacitor is attached to this wafer switch and this is just an easy spot to get to. I don't need to desolder this end. I can leave this end in circuit and just use my capacitor tester to test this just the way it is. And I'll show you how that works here in just a moment. So I'll grab my desoldering tool and well, these are getting pretty tight. Just about doesn't reach. Okay, this is going to get noisy in a moment, so I'll warn you. Okay, I'm warning you. All right. So I'll grab my leakage tester here and place this in here, just like so. Hopefully that'll stay. You can see that okay. All right, and I will attach these leads untangled over here. I'll attach this lead to this end here, and I'll attach the sense lead to the open lead. That's how that has to be. The sense lead can never be attached to anything that's attached in circuit. It always has to be at the lead that's open. And I want to make sure that the sense lead, the boot, isn't touching anything in circuit because this tester is so incredibly sensitive that it will read the leakage of this vinyl boot. In fact, that's part of the alignment procedure for this when this thing is built. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll put this onto the discharge position. Right now, this is in the uh, poly and paper and foil position. So when I click this on to test, what'll happen is this will go red and this should count down and this should turn green again. If it does that, this capacitor has low leakage. And then I'll give it one further test, which is called a forecast test. And the forecast is an extremely sensitive leakage test. So that's used for testing mica capacitors and the like. And if it's fine in the forecast uh, test, then this capacitor is definitely good to go. So I'll test this here. So it should go red and count down. That counted down very fast. So now if I click this into the forecast test and this doesn't count back up, it should be fine. I'll just give it a moment. 
and that's looking really good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to discharge the capacitor and I'm going to actually test this capacitor in the forecast setting. So again, the forecast setting is extremely sensitive and it's really intended for mica capacitors and capacitors that have extremely low leakage, like the ones that I have verified and I've put an entire list up on Patreon about, you know, I've spent a countless amount of hours testing different components and I've put lists up there at any rate. So this is in the forecast setting right now. So what I'll do is I'll click this on to test. And if this counts down, I know this capacitor is extremely good. Oh yeah, this capacitor is really, really good. So that's good to know. So chances are what I'm going to do, just to be absolutely sure, before I go about rebuilding or going through and repairing this, because really I don't think there's much of a rebuild with this, as I go through this thing, what I'm going to do is I'll remove one more of these good all capacitors and verify it. And if it's the same as this one, chances are they're all going to be good. Again, this thing tests for electrical leakage. So this is looking for any trace amounts, extremely small amounts of leakage resistance inside this capacitor. And as you can see, it's virtually nothing. So if you're interested in building one of these things, all the plans, all the schematics, component layout, maps, the printed circuit board layouts, everything is all available on Patreon so you can build one of these things yourself. Very good addition to any bench. Excellent tool. I use this thing all the time, as you can see. So what I'll do now is I'll disconnect this and solder this back into the circuit again. And then let's take this attenuator into lab number one and open this up. I want to see what's inside this thing. Let's take a look inside the attenuator. The plug itself was made by Canon. And as you can see, the signal would obviously go through number four. And then there's three extra pins. You can see that there. So the attenuator needs power. So there's obviously a device inside this attenuator that requires that. So in order to get in here, it looks like we're going to have to remove these four screws and remove this knob. So we can see that there is a somewhat of a set screw in there. So what we want to do is turn that till it's facing this way, because this is basically the shortest way in. And I'll grab my favorite tool here. This thing has been amazing. Whenever I need some form of a hex key or Allen wrench, whatever you want to call it. it. Seems like this thing always works and it's like perfect every time. Great little tool to have around. Let's get that out of there. And there we go. A lot of the times when you tighten the set screw in these things, it scores the shaft a little bit and then they bind when you take them off. So what I'll do next is remove this because I imagine this is probably going to be somehow fastened to this end because there's a connector here, right? This looks like a PL259 or something. Yep. PLSO. SO239, PL259 type of connector. This is a barrel connector here and with a BNC adapter on it so a BNC cable can be used. So that just fits on there. Just leave that on. So what I'll do is I'll just remove this. Take this off of here. Everything is not all that incredibly tight. Take that off there. There it is. Okay, so try and remove these screws without scoring up the face. Gotta love these slot-headed screws. this here I really like you know Phillips or Robertson or even Torx is nice this is a lot less chance of you know, slipping lots of jokes go around about these slot headed screws so let's see if we can get this there it is. Let's take a look inside. Look at that little tube down in there. It's a cute looking little tube. Gold lettering on it. Looks like it's been glued into place. Feels like silicone. And those are the resistors on the attenuator there. So obviously this would use a good contact cleaning. Clean it all out. 
And I imagine it would be pretty good at that point. This is very solid in here. So there's something running directly into this connector down here. So chances are getting this entire unit out. And then of course with this cable, because the cable kind of comes in here and there's no relief would be a real big pain. So we'll just take a look at it through the top. See where the coax comes in. I believe the B version of this had diodes in it. So that is obviously a vacuum tube that has two diodes in it. You can kind of see through the glass. They kind of resemble a 6AL5. Very close. Very neat. So that's what's inside the attenuator. So very soon, we'll go through this thing, see how in alignment the actual TU-50 is, and then, if it's out of alignment, we'll perform an alignment on it and bring the thing back to where it should be so that we can align some 500 series oscilloscopes. Should be a lot of fun. If you're enjoying these videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronic devices alike. Lab number two is absolutely full of very interesting and rare pieces of equipment that we're going to take a look at very quickly. And then down the road, we're going to restore these pieces of equipment together. So it should be a lot of fun. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that. And if you want to be notified as soon as I post a new video, don't forget to tap that bell symbol. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to another 90 videos, and in those 90 videos are a lot of projects that you can take part in, a lot of things that you can build, I'm also sharing many of my designs and inventions up there as well. So definitely check out Patreon if you're interested in this sort of thing. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the Show More tab, and I'll also pin the link right at the top of the comment section. So click on the link, and it'll take you right there. So until next time, take care. Bye for now.